Here is Cindy Faber, and she's going to talk about low redshift galaxies. Hi, folks. So glad to be here and see you here, too. Um, I'm going to talk about low redshift galaxies today. And my talk's rather long. It's in four parts. And I uh, might not get through it. And so I just want to state the big conclusion up front. And that is <clears throat> a growing suspicion on my part that low redshift galaxy evolution is really fundamentally different from high redshift galaxy evolution. And I think we've heard many hints of that in this conference coming from the fact, basically, that at early times, mass assembly is very chaotic, and galaxies are mixed up. Uh, they trade energy and angular momentum uh, from one part to another. Later, they settle. And I believe this, this gives the opportunity for late infalling gas to settle into rings according to its angular momentum. And some of the properties that we're seeing at late times is due to that. So maybe it would be helpful to think in terms of a very simple division of early chaos versus late regularity. And uh, that's obviously an oversimplification, but nevertheless, uh, we could start that way. So here are four parts to this talk. Um, rather than listing them, let me just plunge in. The first, oh, first of all, I want to thank my collaborators, and in particular, the several uh, collaborators that we've had students from China over the years. And we've got three of them who are participating as co-authors in this talk. OK, so part one is a study of Sloan galaxy mass profiles. Mass profiles, as far as I know, haven't been measured yet for Sloan galaxies. And Pinson Zhao has done a heroic job of correcting for point spread function effects. In some sense, measuring mass profiles for Sloan galaxies from the ground is a harder job than getting mass profiles for uh, galaxies from spacecraft. Here's an example of systematic errors that you see before you worry about point spread function corrections. And this is a test afterwards showing that the errors have been properly dealt with. Here's the main result from Pinson. Here we have <coughs> a ratio of the R90 to R50 value in light to the same ratio here, R50, 20 in light. So these are two light values. And now the same pair of ratios in mass. And the solid lines that you see here are the predictions of CIRSIC models. So the first thing that you see is both in light and in mass, the galaxies to first order follow the CIRSIC predictions. Second point is that mass is rather similar to light, but that there's scatter in both of these plots. We believe that scatter is real, and there's richness in the data. Uh, but the important point, I think, for me right now is that because these two plots are the same, these are star-forming galaxies. These are quenched. What is th this is showing us is that two things. First of all, that um, when galaxies go from becoming de Vogeler sorry, exponential to de Vogeler, it's not just a change in their light profiles. It's accompanied by a real change in the mass. And then I think we have to, oh, then we should note that this change is happening while objects are still in the star forming phase. So um, could it be driven just by mergers, which would destroy disks during the star forming phase? Not clear. Leave you with a question here. Is the star formation pattern that we see in galaxies over time consistent with this map, these mass profile changes? Or do stars actually have to move in and out in order to produce a de Vogeler profile? In other words, really, how do galaxies actually build their bulges? And thanks to this wonderful work by Arjun and new data from uh, JWST, I think we're really going to be able to answer that question. OK, let me move to part two. Part two is a study of manga spectral properties and spectral modeling. And the goal is to get a better handle on star formation rates. 
What we're doing is we're comparing optical spectral features and mass to light ratios with H alpha fluxes that are corrected by the bomber decrement. And manga is a great opportunity here because its large IFUs give you a virtually global value of the, um, the global integrated H alpha flux, which gives you a star formation rate after bomber decrement correction. And it also gives you integrated values of spectral features. And the spectral features are not sensitive to dust. And that's why uh, looking at them is so important. OK, so we define a new spectral parameter, which we call spec2, which is the average of these three familiar features. And collectively, spec2 is sensitive to stellar age, metallicity, star formation rate. We can observe spec2 in the middle of the galaxy and globally. And so we take the difference between those two and define a parameter called grad spec2, which is a measure of the radial stellar population gradient. And grad spec2 greater than 0 means that the center of the galaxy is red, old, metal rich. OK, so let's start by comparing uh, the specific star formation rate given by H alpha in the whole IFU with spec2 in the whole IFU raw. So here's what we measure from spec2. And here is H alpha in the bundle, star formation rate specific. And what we're doing is coloring by the bomber decrement. And what you see is a very clear banding here, which puzzled us for months and months and months. And we had a way of explaining it that seemed rather contrived uh, and never was satisfactory at the time completely. And a breakthrough occurred when we started coloring <coughs> the points by a new metals parameter, which I won't have time to explain, but is basically a structural parameter equal to the mass of the galaxy divided by the radius to the 0.7 power. And for other reasons, we found that actually this structural number correlates well with the metallicity of the galaxy. And the banding that appears in this figure is in the expected sense. When this metals parameter is high, the spectral features are stronger. So let's correct for that completely empirically. And then after applying that correction, just a multiplicative correction, we're now coloring by another interesting parameter, which is our grad spec 2 parameter. And remember that that's the difference in the stellar population spectrum from the middle to the edge. And banding again appears, this time in a different orientation and direction. And so we're going to apply an empirical correction for that as well. And this is what's left over after you empirically correct for these two factors. And you can calculate a residual. And the residual here is 0.13 dex in the specific star formation rate after three sigma clipping, which is very small. Uh, and uh, if it's there, there is a, a, an incredibly elegant study by Wang and Lilly calibrating residuals like this based on stellar spectral features. And um, their conclusion is that the scatter in H alpha relative to a spectral feature tells you the fluctuation in the star formation rate over the last 5 or 10 million years relative to a much longer time interval of order a giga year. So interpreting this residual scatter of 0.13 dex, that's how we would interpret our number. Um, very, very small short-term star formation fluctuations in the global manga galaxies. Now, we can do the same thing wavelength by wavelength instead of using stellar spectra, we can use a mass to light ratio in a filter. And again, our assumption is that this mass to light ratio is a function of the specific star formation rate. And can we minimize that by correcting for 
the spectral gradient grad spec 2, a metals parameter, and in this case, also, uh, since it's a photometry measure, mass to light ratio, we need a dust correction. So here's the equation for our metals parameter. I just mentioned it before. And now in the ultraviolet, <coughs> we get an RMS res residual of 0.14 dex, really remarkably tight given the difficulties and errors of observing in the ultraviolet. So um, this performance is repeatedly at essentially all wavelengths from FUV to Ys W4 when these parameters, metals, population gradient, and dust are incorporated into the fix. By the time you average all of them and take into account some observational error here in H alpha, it's probable that we'll have upper limits to short-term star formation fluctuation rates on order of order of 0.1 dex. And it was interesting that that was the number quoted by Clone the other day on Monday for the late stage evolution of his fire simulations. So a point that I'm making that the late stage evolution of galaxies is different from earlier star formation phase, which is a lot burstier. Now it looks like we're in a much steadier phase. OK, so a conclusion is that the integrated stellar spectra of manga are basically a one parameter family after you correct for these complications. And that one remaining parameter is the specific star formation rate. OK, so now let me move on to part three, which is a discussion of uh, these population gradients and possible evolutionary tracks. So let me start with a review of what I think is the state of uh, population gradients in galaxies, starting with high redshift. This is a bit controversial, I think. But my view is that actually these population gradients in star formation rate and age, not dust, but these two more fundamental numbers, started appearing only around a redshift of one or so. So real changes, gradients, in the populations and the star formation rates are relatively recent. They only go back to something like six or eight big years ago. And before that, uh, the specific star formation rate radial profiles are essentially flat out to 2RE. And that's consistent, I think, with an early chaotic phase in which various radii are constantly getting mixed. It tends to make a flat-looking galaxy. <clears throat> OK, at one paper here uh, at a redshift using candles at Z of 0.7 detects incipient gradients and notes that there are two kinds in low mass galaxies. The centers are blue, and it looks as though those galaxies are quenching from the outside in. And the reverse is true at high mass. Now, that's the lead in to numerous amounts of information here locally, in which essentially the same thing is being seen. Uh, Joanna Wu is an author on a very nice manga paper, which really stressed this fact that there are two kinds of quenching that's going on locally. Not all galaxies quench from the inside out, no. There's a whole family of them. We'll talk about more about them in a minute that quenches from the other direction. All right, now let me just mention this diagram, the boot diagram, which Arjun referred to. This is uh, central sigma 1, the projected density within 1 kpc, versus uh, specific star formation rate. This time we're using the beautiful work of um, Samir Salim, who's with us today. And this is the boot upside down. Things are quenching uh, in this general direction. This is the main sequence. This is, was our favorite diagram until recently for describing the evolutionary state of local galaxies. Um, but now we've discovered this diagram, which we call South America for obvious reasons here. OK, and again, this is a specific star formation rate indicator. And instead of using sigma 1 horizontally, this is this population gradient 
indicator. Why do we like this diagram? Because as you'll see, it looks as though it's a more quote unquote face on projection of tracks in today's universe and gives a clearer view of how galaxies are evolving. So the blue centered galaxies that I referred to a moment ago are on this side of the diagram and the red centered galaxies like Andromeda and our galaxy, they populate this side of the diagram. Here we're coloring by sigma one uh, to get you oriented. These are the star forming main sequence and the quenched objects wind up in Patagonia down there. Okay, um, here is a coloration of the diagram using stellar mass. Again, strong systematics visible. And here's a coloration using radius. I'm gonna come back to this in just a second, but let me cut away to another space for just a second, which is sigma one versus mass. And I'm referring to previous papers, notably this paper, Chen 21, which advanced a model for galaxy quenching. It said that uh, objects basically evolve in this direction and encounter a boundary. The gray objects are star forming and the gold objects are the ridge line of quenched galaxies today. And so we put forward the notion that when objects encounter this dot dashed line here, they quench due to the fact that their black holes have reached some critical threshold providing enough feedback energy for quenching. Okay, so this was when first put forward, um, rather schematic, it, that's how I thought about it. I thought of objects moving generally this way, but I didn't think too clearly or carefully beyond that. But now I'm entertaining the thought that actually maybe we should take this literally and think about every object being on essentially parallel paths with the other ones, on tracks, if, if you will. So the thing that's kind of motivating me is what I call the HR diagram example, in which you look at an HR diagram and you say, here are some stars near the main sequence turnoff, here are some giant stars. Because the locus doesn't change very much during the evolution time, I can really say to high accuracy that that main sequence star is going to evolve into that giant star. Now, in the case of galaxies, this breaks down because the evolution time across this diagram is giga years and the whole locus might be changing in the meantime. So I don't wanna take this too literally. Um, I'm thinking of, of, of tracks in a more metaphorical sense, illustrative, not literal, but let's just pursue that thought and see uh, where it leads us. Okay. I'd like to remind you of the fact that if you don't think naturally in terms of sigma one at a fixed mass, then you can take refuge in the notion that it really correlates closely with the radius of a galaxy. And at a fixed mass, that radius variation is large. It's a factor of five or so down here. So there's a lot of scatter in galaxy properties at a given mass in the local universe. So because these tracks these color banding and radii almost follow the track hypothesis that uh, on the previous slide, it follows that if we were to look at tracks in the space of radius versus mass, they would be more horizontal. And here are the tracks that I just showed you, re-projected using the 50% half mass radius instead of sigma one, and you can see that uh, the tracks are basically horizontal and objects would evolve almost horizontally. And I think the first paper that actually said that galaxies evolve along horizontal, basic horizontal tracks in this space was a paper by Arjun. And I think Frank, you're also on the paper, if I recall back in 2009. So these are not uh, thoughts that are that new. All right, so let's take the track idea and see if we can see any evidence imprinting on it in other diagrams. And the answer is yes, the tracks are visible in our South American diagram 
Track 5, which was at the top, at high densities are colored red in this diagram, and track 1 is at the bottom and is colored black. So track 1 goes this way. We're calling this Brazil, and we're calling these the Andes, OK? Uh, so uh, I'm, again, it's convenient, of not quite literally true, to think that galaxies are actually evolving in, in these directions. So here's a summary of the properties of uh, the objects on the two tracks. And this track here turns to, out to be the uh, quenching mode uh, with blue centers quenching outside in, low mass galaxies, as it turns out in the Andes. And these are the more standard uh, quenching inside out galaxies in Brazil. And the track idea is useful because it gives you an idea of how things move in other diagrams. And the prediction here is that Brazil galaxies evolve into very high mass objects, and Andes objects evolve into um, small quenched objects. OK, so uh, Andes galaxies are not on the standard Hubble sequence. And here are some pictures, though, of what it looks like, these blue centered objects. Uh, and you can see the outer parts look old, and star formation is concentrated towards the middle. OK, so this is how objects are uh, evolving. If you look at their star formation rates in their center versus their global values, you can put a vector on every object. And it's a good thing, in general, those vectors lie along the locus, which uh, is supposed to describe the positions of the galaxies. Um, in more detail, you can see that the ones at the top tend to flare upwards. And they would be quenching more rapidly because they're encountering the high black hole mass regime more rapidly, whereas these tracks down here tend to angle off and flatten, which would suggest that maybe they're quenching more slowly or maybe even would never actually quench, uh, at least not in the near term. And similar behavior is seen in TNG 100, that's a typo, um, and was attributed to the angular momentum of late infalling gas in this study by uh, Joanna and her colleagues. In Brazil, late infalling gas has high angular momentum and falls far out, uh, whereas here in the Andes, it would be uh, low angular momentum falling towards the middle of the galaxy. And that's seen in TNG 100. OK. So uh, how much more time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes, OK. Um, this is a, a study of um, AGNs and where they occur in these low mass galaxies, Manga and, uh, uh, and Sloan. So here's the conventional way of finding Seifert II galaxies. And there are various difficulties with those diagrams. We noticed that there are correlations between the stellar population age, our spec 2 parameter, and various other aspects of galaxy line emissions, their line ratios, and also their luminosities. And that led us to look for a new diagram in which the Seiferts would stand out more clearly. And this is our favorite diagram. O3 over O2 versus the equivalent width of O3. It's the only diagram we know of in which the Seiferts really stand out clearly apart from the underlying normals. So um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go rapidly. We've discovered, we've identified a whole bunch of new AGNs using that new criterion. Here's what they look like in the old BPT diagram and in a relative diagram uh, using oxygen lines. And the interesting question is, to what extent uh, in, say, the old BPD diagram like this, we have our new AGNs, but there are an awful lot of other objects there. What are they? Are they mixtures of AGNs? Bottom line is that they're just aging emission line galaxies. They have aging stellar spectra. They have aging emission line properties. 
We did a k-means clustering on them and identified three different classes. These are star forming, these are fully quenched liners, and these are intermediate. Okay, so leaping ahead, um, we found uh, matching analogs, doppelgangers, for each AGN. And this allows us to study by matching where the uh, host galaxy lies when the AGN is off in these diagrams. And so this is the locus of hosts without an AGN. The red points are the AGNs turned on, and the arrows connect them. They show you how objects move when the AGN turns on. Here's the oxygen diagram showing a clear aging evolutionary path and uh, arrows connecting the roots with, uh, with the AGNs when they're turned on. So our picture basically is that, I'm almost done, is that uh, there's an evolutionary path in both stars and gas, and Seifert's appear and pop on and off from various uh, locations along this path. Finally, we can map the location of the Seifert galaxies in the boot diagram. This is the Seifert frequency that we find with our new identifications. These, this is the Eddington ratio locus. It has an interesting slope here, which uh, could indicate that you need a deeper potential well in the form of a deeper sigma 1 to initiate black hole growth when star formation rate is high. And uh, our last picture here is the location of the AGNs in the South America diagram. And at first glance, these are the Andes galaxies quenching from outside in. Their centers are full of gas, and they have many active AGNs. This is uh, Brazil over here, and it looks as though the frequency is lower. Is this a real difference in quenching mode depending upon what track you're on? Or perhaps it has more to do with time scales. Perhaps the evolutionary rate through here is very slow, so that the frequency looks low, but it's only because of long crossing times. So we won't know uh, what the interpretation of this diagram is, really, until we have evolutionary tracks that give us different directions through the diagram. But at that point, I think uh, we've really elucidated a, <clears throat> a new dependence uh, on AGN properties that is correlated with this new parameter, the spectral gradient which I'm arguing is of late origin and uh, characterizes galaxies today, but not in the past. Thank you. OK, thank you, Cindy. Uh, questions? Thank you very much, Sandy, again for this. Um, you have. Uh, insisted a lot on the fact that it doesn't apply at high redshift. Um, however, many of the diagnostic plots that you show, so M, M star sigma 1, the boot diagram, we've seen with candles that they are the same at redshift 3. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so I wanted to know your thoughts about that. Why, you know, where do we see in the diagrams that, you know, this doesn't work at high redshift? Or? Well, it, it may be that the answer is precisely as I said at the end of the talk, namely, that once we understand real crossing times and can calculate real frequencies, durations, duty cycles, and so on, we'll find that the simple explanation that you know a black hole doing so much work actually is the answer, and it's a uniform answer at all redshifts. But I think the Chen, the Chen picture was so simple, it was just a line in uh, sigma 1 versus mass, and now we always thought, hmm, there's variations in star formation rate, there's variations, other properties inside that line, and we're pulling apart those extra dimensions, which I think we have to do in order to fully understand the process. A question about this last part here. Um, a story that people often told is about the simultaneous evolution of star formation and black hole growth. Um, this picture, though, seems to suggest that black hole growth occurs just 
before galaxies quench, and there's a disconnect between star formation and black hole growth. Yeah. Can you comment? Um, well, this is the point where black holes become visible. They've presumably been growing before, but they're hard to detect because they're swamped by the emission lines of the normal star formation phase. But, but does it mean that you might be underestimating deeper fractions or angular ratios in the very star formation population? That's always been true. So it is, that's still yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Maybe Kevin, you could also start setting up. Um, yeah, so, oh, there's one more. And I will hold back on my question. The, the galaxies with blue centers, um, did you look at the satellite fraction there? Or if, if there are All many of satellites, the, it would be stripping yeah, going very, on? Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, I didn't say that um, uh, the, um, the Sloan sample is not satellites, it's just isolated in centrals alone. So this last plot is Sloan by itself. The manga picture has both satellites and, uh, and centrals in it. If I do that for Sloan, there are a lot of satellites that are Andes galaxies. So I think your point is, is right on. I think uh, a lot of the outside in quenching could very well be environmental. But not all, so not all of them are satellites. Okay, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> so now we go to the next uh, speaker, to Kevin, Kevin Bundy, the last speaker of today, if I'm correct. Um, it's about message galaxy assembly, but we're still actually setting up. <laughs>